Welcome to today's roundtable. Um, this is one of our first hybrid events of the term, and it's a great pleasure to see some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, we're delighted to welcome uh, many friends, both online and in person. Um, I was told that for those who want to engage with the online uh, group, if you'd like to sit in this middle part, um, you're most welcome to do so. Uh, that way your video will be captured by those who are joining us from uh, elsewhere. Um, in terms of our participants, we have a number of uh, colleagues joining us both from within Hong Kong U, within the diverse faculties here. We have, uh, even within medicine, I saw some registers, um, political science, sociology, within law, uh, within the uh, physical sciences. Um, we are also pleased to welcome members of the DOJ and also the um, uh, various uh, uh, organizations within Hong Kong. So uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce our topic, which is greening the Belt and Road, uh, risk mitigation, dispute pre prevention and resolution. And um, I'm honored to welcome and introduce our keynote today, which is Dr. Ma Jun. Dr. Ma Jun is currently the chairman of the Green Finance Committee, uh, China Society for Finance and Banking, and also the former member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the People's Bank of China. He led the drafting of China's Green Finance Guidelines between 2015 and 2016, and he facilitated global consensus on scaling up green finance under the G20 framework between 2016 and 2018. As a leader in the field of green and sustainable finance, Dr. Ma Jun also serves as the Sustainable Finance Special Advisor of the United Nations Environment Program, the Director of the Beijing Green Finance Association, and the Chairman of, and President of the Hong Kong Green Finance Association, among other public welfare or organizations in Hong Kong. So with that, I'd like to invite you to join me in welcoming Dr. Ma Jun. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ali, the uh, kind introduction. Um, and it's my great honor and pleasure to uh, be with uh, the uh, Faculty of Law of Hong Kong U and uh, your uh, colleagues and uh, guests uh, to discuss this issue of green belt and rope. Um, I think I'll be spending probably 20, 25 minutes on a couple of issues. Uh, one is uh, uh, really my uh, sort of attention in the past uh, seven, eight years, the green financial and uh, how we get it started in China and uh, kicked off uh, in a lot of international platforms. Then I'll come back to this uh, green investment uh, in the Belt and Road uh, issue, uh, which focus on what I call the green investment principle. That's a mechanism uh, which China Green Finance Committee and City of London jointly launched back four years ago. There are a lot of operational uh, 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 topics under that principle, which I think will be certainly relevant to uh, the legal professions uh, today uh, in terms of uh, you know, risk analysis, risk mitigation, and mediation arbitrage, and so on. Now, starting from uh, this uh, green finance topic uh, back uh, in 2013, uh, when I was still in Hong Kong, at that time I was chief economist for Greater China at Deutsche Bank in Hong Kong. I was hosting a big conference in Beijing. I remember that was uh, January 13, 2013, um, so nearly 10 years ago. And uh, on that day, we had a conference of, I think, uh, attended by like 1,000 people, uh, including a lot of international investors in Beijing Grand High Hotel. This is a five-star hotel. And uh, <clears throat> the problem is that uh, when I was speaking at a conference, I couldn't hear myself. Why? <clears throat> the people sitting there, they were all coughing. And uh, <clears throat> that day, we realized PM 2.5 index, which is the measure of air pollution intensity, went up to 1,000 in Beijing. Now, for those of you who uh, know the environment, uh, 25 is the threshold. 
to be safe uh, in terms of air quality. And uh, in that day, that number was 1,000. So it really triggered uh, my serious thought on you know, why um, we had this problem and how we in the financial community can help uh, actually contribute to resolving this uh, air pollution problem. Um, we you know, helped a lot of investors investing in different sectors at that time, I think, uh, mostly in heavy manufacturing, very polluting activities. Uh, I remember in these years, uh, the most popular investments was in coal-related um, projects and uh, you know, coal and big commodity projects and all that were making a lot of money. But in fact, they were polluting, they were power intensive, uh, they harmed the uh, you know, biodiversity and nature. So uh, that triggered a, a serious uh, um, study, which I led in 2013. And uh, later on, that study was published in Chinese. It's called PMR Dian Wu Jian Pai de Jing Ji I know Professor Ali, you know Chinese. It's uh, economics of reducing PM 2.5. That's, that's what we call it in Chinese in that book. And uh, it was also published in English uh, in, in the US, the book <clears throat> later on. It was called uh, uh, the economics of uh, air pollution uh, in China. So <clears throat> within that book, uh, I um, raised a uh, concept of changing uh, investor behavior uh, <clears throat> with the purpose of improving sustainability or <clears throat> uh, initially dealing with the air pollution issue. Now, how do I do that? Uh, I actually proposed a formula um, of what I call a new microeconomics. Um, those economic students uh, uh, here, you must uh, you know, read all these formulas within the textbook, which says the economic agent, namely a company, has objective of maximizing profit. Right? <clears throat> That's a foundation of economics and how you know, economic transactions uh, you know, happen. Um, and uh, I realized that if you do this, you end up channeling a lot of financial resources to polluting carbon intensive and nature uh, damaging activities. Why? Uh, because uh, uh, profit seeking and sustainability are somewhat contradictory uh, in many areas with externality. Right? The externality being you know, environmental pollution, uh, being carbon emission, being uh, negatively affecting biodiversity. Now, without incorporating ex then externality into your decision making process, your profit maximizing activities will lead to negative consequences and outcome on sustainability. So what I proposed is a new formula uh, to shape the behavior of the economic agents, including corporates. Namely, the objective needs to be uh, consisting of two parts. Part one is uh, profit maximization. Part two is reputation maximization. And these two parts can be combined uh, with a formula of uh, two coefficients. It's alpha multiply the uh, profit maximization plus beta multiplies the uh, reputation of maximization. Now, if you have that, you change the behavior. Um, when they maximize a new objective function, they tend to allocate more resources into uh, environmentally more friendly projects. Uh, compare with the status quo. So how do you construct this system? And this system is uh, what I call later a green financial system. The green financial system is designed to change the behavior of investors so that they can allocate more to green and allocate less to brown, or what I call polluting and carbon intensive activities. Uh, <clears throat> that was a sort of a economic theory which I followed in the following few years after I joined the PBOC as chief economist in the research bureau, um, beginning to be you know, in charge of a new program which is called Green Financial Policy uh, at the Central Bank. In 2014, I led the uh, Green Finance Task Force in the Central Bank in China. We proposed the 14 actions to build what we call a green financial system. And in 2015, most of the 14 proposals went into the Central Party Committee and State Council document uh, named Eco Civilization Reform Plan. <clears throat> so effectively, we, we, we got it endorsed by the top leadership in China. And then it translated into a request from top leadership in China to the Central Bank 
for leading the drafting of a green financial policy guideline. Uh, that's what I did in 2014, uh, 15 and 16. And within the policy guideline, we came up with 35 actions. And these are the actions taken by, or to be taken by the seven different ministries in China, including the central bank, the banking regulator, security regulator, insurance regulator, uh, Minister of Finance, Environmental Ministry, and NDRC, which is the planning agency. Um, and uh, if you sort of simplify the framework, it boils down to what I call four pillars for the green financial system. Number one, you need to define what is green. Right? Without clear definition, um, you know, anyone can claim what I'm doing is green, and in fact, it's not green. That's greenwashing. So to prevent that, we need to have clear definition for those investors to channel their resources into the uh, sort of credibly uh, green and sustainable projects. So we created this uh, green lending uh, taxonomy in 2013. We created this uh, green bond taxonomy in 2015. And we created the uh, green project taxonomy in 2019. So by that time, China had uh, actually the first set of green taxonomy uh, compared with any other major economies. Now, later on, many other economies, including EU, they developed their sustainable finance taxonomy, which is now also looking very good and solid. Uh, that's what I call pillar one. Um, the pillar two is disclosure, which is critical in driving investor behavior. Disclosure what? Uh, disclose information related to environmental and other sustainability impacts of your activities. For example, as a bank, if you lend it to a project, uh, and you claim this is a green one, then you have to tell me how much CO2 you're reducing, how much SO2 or NOx, which are air pollutants, you're reducing, and how much you know, wastewater you have reduced, and uh, uh, you know, to what extent you have improved you know, biodiversity and so on. And these numbers need to be calculated, uh, need to be reported, and uh, uh, reported not to just to the uh, regulator, but also general public. So that's what we call disclosure requirements. Of course, these uh, uh, requirements are evolving over time and they're becoming more and more complex uh, internationally. It's now following the TCFD. And, and based on TCFD, there is a mechanism called ISSB, International Sustainability Standard Board, uh, which the G20 endorsed last year. Um, I think all these things are, are moving in the right direction. And why disclosure is so important? Uh, because uh, indeed it changed the behavior uh, in significant way of the corporates. Um, you know, a lot of people here, I think, are working on ESG. And the uh, uh, SFC in Hong Kong, I think the main thing they do is disclose, uh, making sure that the, the corporates, the listed ones, will disclose enough information on uh, <clears throat> the sustainability related you know, impacts, uh, risks, and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> after being forced to disclose, um, <clears throat> the uh, corporates will face a lot of public pressure. If you're doing something wrong, uh, the public will criticize you. Uh, the government may penalize you. The general, you know, uh, the consumers may not buy your stuff and the investors may not provide lending to you or provide investment to you. So all these pressures through disclosure become uh, uh, what I described in my formula part two. It's a maximization of reputation. Right? <clears throat> Otherwise you don't have the beta. The beta is zero without disclosure. And the disclosure substantially enhance the size of the beta in my objective function. And this is by design. Um, it's not, you know, out of blue. It's, it's designed by regulator uh, so that the behavior can be changed. And uh, <clears throat> the third thing is a pillar is what I call incentives. Uh, <clears throat> we, um, <clears throat> at that time I was talking about the government, we, and I was sitting in the central bank, need to design certain incentives to encourage green behavior and the discouraged brown behavior. Uh, by encouraging, uh, just give you one example, what we uh, in the Chinese Central Bank was doing is to provide a, uh, what we call decarbonization facility. That facility offers low cost funding through the commercial banking system to green projects. If these projects are meeting certain standards, for example, uh, you are renewable energy, you are decarbonizing the industry, you uh, apply CCUS, then you can apply for the central bank money at a cost of 1.75% annual rate, which is much, much lower than the market rate. Uh, so this is a type of incentive <clears throat> which uh, will also change behavior of the corporates or, or the investors or the lenders. 
And uh, finally, uh, the pillar four is uh, what I call the financial product suites. We need to have a lot of different financial products to um, assist certain economic, uh, green economic activities to find the money at a lower cost um, or <clears throat> at, uh, uh, with more availability. Just to give you one example, <clears throat> what we did in 2016 was to create the uh, green bond market. Why do we create green bond market? Because the green loan market uh, isn't able to provide enough long-term lending. Uh, the loan market is constrained by the mismatch of maturity between assets and liability side of the banking system. Uh, because we take too much deposits, which are short-term, and the banks are unable to lend a lot of uh, long-term loans. Otherwise, the mismatch will lead to financial risks. But uh, a lot of green projects are long-term. They need money, uh, which has a duration of 10 years and 20 years. For example, you build a, uh, a, 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 a subway. Uh, <clears throat> the repayment you know, may take 20 years. You cannot just keep borrowing every two years, uh, which will involve a lot of refinancing risk. So we create this uh, green bond market. And on this market, you can issue a bond uh, which has a, uh, uh, a term of you know, five years and 10 years and 20 years and even 30 years, which will match your project cycle and repayment cycle. So this is a type of innovation uh, which we, uh, we, we, we uh, led uh, in China. So far, after the implementation of four pillars, we now have the largest green lending market in the world uh, with outstanding green loans at 20 trillion RMB in China. We have the second largest green bond market uh, with outstanding green bonds at 1.5 trillion. And we have 700 green funds um, created in the past couple of years and many you know, more innovative green products. Uh, <clears throat> that's a, uh, I think, quick, but uh, probably too lengthy introduction to the China effort. Uh, and uh, now moving on to the international side, uh, there are lots of international initiatives which we were involved in creating and uh, running for example, the G20 um, initially uh, called the Green Finance Study Group, which was launched in 2016. Now, that time I was still in the central bank and we proposed in the Chinese central bank that uh, we should take the opportunity of China hosting G20 as presidency in 2016 to create something new and impactful uh, and positive for the global economy. And uh, then we ended up with creating the Green Finance Study Group to form a new consensus. So uh, that was year one in 2016. I co-chaired this group together with a, a colleague from Bank of England uh, because we thought we needed someone you know, like me from developing country and someone like Michael Sheeran from uh, OECD countries to co-host and co-chair to bring uh, enough support from different parts of the world. So we successfully reached the consensus in that year of scaling up green finance globally. Uh, it was written into the G20 leaders community that's endorsed by the G20 leaders. And then over the following years, there was a lot of uh, G20 studies on how to develop the green financial markets, how to uh, make uh, environmental information more available, how to use uh, technology uh, to assist sustainable uh, finance um, practices and so on. And uh, this group evolved into a working group last year. Uh, it was actually elevated uh, to the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group, uh, which has, uh, I guess, two new features. One is the permanence, uh, because uh, you know, being a working group is not something that any uh, presidency can you know, uh, decide to remove. And secondly, a working group is able to produce policy recommendations rather than just reading options. So last year, uh, I was still co-chairing this uh, uh, working group. Now, uh, with uh, our U.S. counterpart from Treasury, we produced uh, the G20 Small Finance Roadmap with 19 actions that guides the international work of sustainable finance in the coming few years. And one of the key items in the roadmap is uh, to develop a transition finance framework. Now, this is quite new to uh, a lot of people, even in the green finance space, because in the past six, seven years, everybody was focusing on financing green projects. Green projects uh, are what we describe as uh, you know, close to net zero in terms of carbon emission and very clean in terms of environmental impact. Um, <clears throat> but the new problem that's arising is uh, there's so many activities in the brown sector 
um, in the carbon intensive sector, for example, uh, in the coal fired power generation, steel, cement, petrochemical, you know, transportation, and the old building sector, we need to uh, do something to decarbonize these activity. We cannot simply eliminate them. Uh, they need to continue, but in the much lower carbon fashion and eventually moving towards net zero. And in this process, we have to give them finance. We need to help them rather than uh, uh, stop them from operating altogether. And that's what we call transition finance. So for that purpose, uh, this year, the G20 group, uh, which I coach here, is working on five pillars of transition finance framework, including definition of transition activity, disclosure of transition activity, financial instruments to support transition, and the government incentives to support the decarbonization. And finally, uh, just transition, which is a topic I think David would be interested. You look at culture and social, just transition, uh, you know, will want to take care of many non-economic aspects of the transition process, for example, employment. Uh, in case a transition activity undertaken by a company leads to a lot of uh, uh, layoffs, what would you do to that? You know, can you do something to uh, 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 sort of uh, make sure that investors actually can help reduce unemployment? Uh, that's what we are trying to design in the transition finance framework to incorporate a just element uh, into it. But anyway, these are some of the international initiatives which uh, I was uh, and, and China were deeply involved. But let me come back to the, the Belt and Road, which is the main topic uh, for, for today. In 2018, um, the, uh, the Green Finance Committee in China, which I led, uh, uh, began to uh, uh, form this idea of launching a green lesson principle for the Belt and Road because we fear. Uh, uh, without the green principles, a lot of uh, investment into the Belt and Road region uh, may actually go uh, to the polluting and uh, carbon intensive sector, um, which uh, will uh, be harmful to sustainability of the region. And uh, uh, we organized some initial thoughts on you know, how to guide investors uh, towards uh, greener and sustainable investments. And uh, we came up uh, uh, towards end of 2018, a set of principles. And these principles were led by China Green Finance Committee, City of London, and, uh, and they were joined uh, by a couple of other international bodies, uh, including the World Government Forum, the Policy Institute, IFC under the World Bank, and uh, uh, BRBR, which is Belt and Road Banking uh, Roundtable, and, 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 and others. Um, so seven organizations jointly launched this uh, set of principles, which we call, in short, GIP, Green Lesson Principle. And these principles look like following. Mm, uh, it's actually just seven sentences if you go on our website. Uh, one of them is that uh, we ask investors investing in the Belt and Road region to understand the uh, sustainability related risks. Uh, meaning, uh, do you know that uh, your investments may impact on the environment? Um, uh, climate and uh, biodiversity, um, and what are the risks that's involved, right? And secondly, uh, you need to quantify uh, these risks and uh, disclose uh, such information to so being transparent. And thirdly, you need to communicate to the community uh, that are likely to be impacted. And uh, also, we are calling for uh, using of financial green financial instruments so that uh, green finance can help you to drive your uh, uh, business, you know, towards green, and, uh, uh, and 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 a couple of other things, uh, including usage of third-party services to help you mitigate risks, um, and so on. So uh, after we publish these uh, principles, we began to gather support from potential members. So really, within I think about seven eight months, by the middle of two thousand nineteen, when China was hosting the Belt and Road Summit, we had twenty five signatures. Uh, involving uh, most of the large Chinese banks, including you know, China Development Bank, Info Export Bank, ICBC, Bank of China, and so on, and most of the European and the UK banks, uh, including uh, you know, my old employer, Deutsche Bank, and the UBS, uh, BNP, uh, Standard Charter, HSBC, and so on. So um, uh, 
and, and a couple of emerging market uh, financial institutions, uh, including from uh, Mongolia, from Sri Lanka, from Thailand, uh, and a couple from Morocco and so on. But uh, their participation were relatively more limited and size-wise they are smaller in terms of financial assets man managed. But now uh, we have uh, 40 something signatories. Um, most of them are very large financial organizations uh, within the respective countries coming from uh, 16 countries and regions. And we have uh, more than a dozen supporting institutions. Um, they are not formal member, but they're supporting the operation of the agreement investment principles. Within the principle, we created three working groups to drive the capacity building of green investment. Number one, it's called uh, <clears throat> risk analysis. And this has a lot to do with the risk mitigation uh, topic. You do <clears throat> analysis on environmental impact, uh, meaning uh, is your project creating pollution, you know, <clears throat> water pollution, air pollution, land contamination? Uh, is your project leading to higher carbon emission? And uh, is your project destroying biodiversity? Uh, so these are type of risks which uh, we, we ask our members to assess for the investment. And we provide tools. Uh, we developed a couple of tools, uh, including one of them uh, being used to measure the biodiversity impact. It's like a big map. Uh, you can uh, click on the, uh, the, the, this particular spot on the map, and it will tell you uh, what are the biodiversity risks uh, that you might be facing and uh, you need to assess. And uh, the second working group is uh, uh, working on improving the uh, disclosure. Uh, it's uh, modeled after TCFD, the Task Force of Climate Related Disclosure Recommendation. And uh, uh, essentially we're asking all our members to disclose your uh, green strategy, your targets, uh, your governance, and, and your uh, green activities uh, and environmental impacts. Um, and uh, some began to disclose carbon, uh, namely how carbon intensive your investments and portfolios are. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, effort has been uh, growing, I think, very rapidly in the past couple of years. We're actually having a GIP annual meeting this afternoon. We'll announce the improvement in results of transparency and disclosure uh, this afternoon uh, among our members. And the third working group is looking at the financial instruments to assist uh, green investment in the Bergen Road region. Um, meaning uh, we want to make finance more available and cheaper for green projects. Uh, for example, using blended financing tools. Uh, blended financing meaning some financing sources are cheaper, uh, maybe coming from multinational uh, and from donors, subsidies and so on. When they combine it with commercial finance, the overall financing cost for green projects can be lowered and making the projects more viable uh, in, terms, uh, in terms of bankability and so on and so forth. So this is what the third um, uh, working group is working on. And also they created a lot of new ideas on how to structure financial products to make certain transactions uh, feasible uh, than, than otherwise. Um, beyond the working group, we had a, a couple of projects team uh, which may be in the future upgraded to working group. One project team is looking at a project database. Uh, essentially, we gather the green projects from the emerging markets or the Belt and Road country in general and uh, connecting them with finance within our network so that the finance will be able to uh, you know, uh, see uh, these investment opportunities and project owners will be able to connect to uh, more uh, financial institutions. And uh, uh, additional efforts are being made to localize uh, the green investment principles in the Bernard, for the Bernard Law. Uh, namely, we created the Central Asian chapter of the GIP uh, back a year ago. We asked the former uh, Pakistan Central Bank Governor, uh, Mr. Anwa, to chair uh, the GIP Central Asian chapter. And the Astana uh, Green Finance Center is hosting, uh, being the secretary. So. Two of them, uh, Pakistan and, uh, and Astana, are, are working together to build a local network of GIP. And they brought um, you know, some local financial institutions into the network as an observer initially. And later on, they recommend some relatively more mature candidates into the GIP as official uh, signatory. And the second effort we are making is to create a Africa uh, regional chapter for uh, GIP. 
and we have identified a candidate for the African chapter of chairman, uh, who is uh, Hendrik. Uh, he's uh, the president of 91, 91 being the largest aspect uh, in South Africa. And he's very keen uh, in driving sustainability. So uh, we have a plan to actually announce the official launch of African regional chapter of GIP at the COP uh, this year. And next year, we may be launching a ASEAN regional chapter uh, for the GIP so that uh, we have more local networks uh, to uh, mobilize the participation of local financial institutions in these countries and channel our resources created at the uh, sort of a GIP uh, the central level in terms of capacity building uh, tools and methodologies uh, into the, uh, the global network of emerging market institutions. Sorry, I didn't touch much about uh, you know, risk uh, mediation, or arbitration, and so on. That's uh, your field. But uh, you know, be very happy to interact uh, in our conversation uh, in, the, in the next uh, 30, 40 minutes. With that, uh, let me thank Professor Abby again for giving me this uh, opportunity uh, for introduction. Thank you. Mm -hmm.